Hello, everyone. My name is Ofer Shinar. I'm uh, working at Western Digital for the next generation uh, platform technologist at the CTO. My team is leading uh, firmware and toolchain efforts for RISC-5. And today I want to present you a feature that we are open sourcing. It's called Cacheable Overlay Manager for RISC-5. In short, we call it COMOV. It's a software paging mechanism, uh, which we I will introduce in a second. So the agenda for today is I will talk a little bit about uh, solving code space limitation with software. Is a small introduction. Uh, some basic concepts and use cases for this feature. The building blocks are that we needed in order to make this happen on software and tool chain. And the deployments. So let's start with short introduction. So on the early days of computing, there was a technique to load code on runtime uh, on the moment it was needed. Uh, actually, one of the first examples we can see is by NASA using this technique uh, on the early days of shuttle flight control systems when the code itself was replaced uh, from the moment uh, there was the land sequence and then there is a, the orbit sequence and the code itself was changed. So this is a, a well-known technique. We're just uh, reviving it. Uh, this technique was called overlay. It gave an easy interface to the user and the software engineer. There was no need for any complex hardware IPs like MMU, etc. And it was threaded with the toolchain and the firmware itself. Today, IoT devices have the same problem with memory. They have a very small footprint of memory, and uh, they need some, some solution. Alongside with these five issues with code density, uh, it just brings up the, the usage of let's use overlay. Some basic concepts. OK, so the basic concept is like there is, a, there is an engine in the middle of the, the screen here. This engine is running on the fast memory. And it's uh, responsible to decide what to, to be loaded and what not to be loaded from the storage device on the right, which is the slow memory. It can be whatever storage it you wish. And then it decides what to load into the fast memory, to the SR. We call it a cache area. We call it in a cache area uh, or in heap. And this is uh, where uh, the code is running according to the running flow. The main uh, engine uh, workload is to invoke the overlay calls and also to decide what to evict and what to load. Now, let's look how it looks today for just normal function. Okay. So for a normal function where there's a bar and foo, Full calling bar, then the toolchain will generate a jump to bar. This is, by the way, an instruction for RIS5. And now it looks when you're using an overlay. So when you're using an overlay, all that is needed from the user is just to put an attribute saying, my function is an overlay, and then it writes this function as, as it is. Foo is calling bar, and that's it. But beneath that, the toolchain will generate a token, or a descriptor as we call it here, and push it into a jump address that we are entering the comma of the engine itself. So Inside this engine, the engine itself will decide what to load, why it will uh, pass this token and understand where it is, where it needs to be loaded, etc. And another thing that's very important to say that once we are inside an overlay function, then all, all the calling for functions and all the callers calling back to the function have to run to the engine. That's because when you're coming back from a function, sometimes your caller can be evicted. It was not there anymore or it got moved. That's why you're going back to the engine to decide if this function was loaded or not, or if it, need, if it was evicted, then it, it will load it again. Let's talk about grouping and what it means. So since we are loading from low speed storage, we want to load much, as much function as we want in the same context, meaning grouping. So in grouping, we have functions, overlay functions, and read only data of overlay. When a runtime module will decide what to load the function, it will actually load the entire group. And this will solve us the painful storage load time. We can configure the uh, grouping in size between half a K and four kilobytes. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's not fixed, meaning that we can get, you can get uh, a size of groups between this size and 4K. So you can have all kinds of permutations on this grouping size in resolution of half a K. 
So it just makes sense to group things together, right? That are relationships together, like uh, when you're calling a, a spy feature or you're calling a sleep module or whatever that you're developing, you want to put those all in one group in order to make just one shot of loading. So we, we provide several uh, features in order to support that. There is the obvious feature, that which is we call manually, manually grouping, when the user just register his uh, functions to a group. He knows what, what he needs, and then he register to a specific group, and that group will hold his functions. There's an, another option, we call it an automatically option, which we automatically trigger by the, by the grouping tool invoked by the linker. You will need a pre-prepared pre sorry, a profile a file that we provide to the linker. We need to we'll invoke the automatically a grouping tool, which I present later on concepts of how it works. And the obvious solution that you don't, have, don't need uh, any grouping. So if you don't need any grouping, you don't care about performance at all, then each function will be in its own group. Another concept we are calling, calling it a multi-grouping, uh, it's a, it's a very special, unique for, for this feature. Uh, and let's look at an example and explain that by an example. Sometimes different software scenarios can run the same function. For example, let's assume that the cache area, the heap that we have, is very small. It's just fitting to just for just one group. So in this example, we can see my full function is in group A. It's used by function 42 in that group. And you also need it by function 1003, which is in group B. Meaning, we need to evict, we need to evict A when B is running, and back to A when my full function is done running. Okay? So when function 1003 will call that function, we need to evict B and go back to A, and, and vice versa. As a result, there are going to be too many loads. It will take just too much time. The solution is that for multi-grouping is that my full function can be live in the same group in both of the groups. It can be in group A and also in group B. Then when function 1003 will call my function full, you will see it's in its own group and no need for evict or load group A. So a little bit about the logic flow of the engine, and, and this is very little bit. <laughs> Uh, overlay function will pass through a combo V runtime engine here, okay? The engine itself is written in C in assembly, and that's why it's traded with a target for RISC-V. The main engine itself, sorry, the main engine itself will, will do a few things. That's the main uh, workload. It will uh, load or evoke, invoke overlay function. It will also handle evict algorithm as a cache, with cache, cache, sorry, cache concepts, so we like an LRU or et cetera. This is what the grouping tool itself, sorry, this is what the engine itself is doing. And it also have a fragmentation algorithm in order to, to do, you know, to close holes in the memory when you evict uh, groups. The building blocks we needed for uh, having this uh, tool works. So, with our collaborator from Embecosm, uh, we did a lot of changes on the tool chain. As a compiler, we choose the LVM and the Clang as a front end. The compiler will just create special calls for the overlay functions, as we see earlier. For linker, we choose the GNU LD, uh, did a few changes around the BFD, creating a descriptors, tokens, as we saw it, for functions, and offset table for overlay functions. Those tokens and the, the, the tables are being used by the engine itself on runtime. So this is all, all for the engine itself. As a debugger, we'll choose GDB to provide easy interface to the user for debugging overlay functions and overlay calls. Because sometimes you want to do a step into a function and just get into your function. Don't want to do all the mechanism of the overlay. But sometimes you do want to debug the overlay engine itself. So we need awareness from the debugger side. Other utilities, uh, the grouping tool, some extension to map file, and other service utilities that we are going to provide. That's all to make the life easier for the engineer to develop and to design. And that's all coming. So grouping. So I want to show with you uh, the grouping tool techniques. Okay, but uh, that's, that's like um, 
very high level uh, concept of how it works. Uh, so you can see here an histogram okay, of, of time. And each color here represents an overlay function, which is being called 12 times, for example, here, and 10 times, for example, here. That's the orange ones. And there is the blue ones, etc. Then we can see there is kind of uh, in each stage here, that's a lot of activities here, and then a lot of activities here, here, and here. Okay, so what this uh, grouping tool need to do is need to follow and split all the activities and find their hot areas in order to make a recommendation to do a grouping. So let's separate that and see how it works. So we can see, fun so the grouping tool will get a pre-prepared profile, as I saw, as I mentioned earlier, for all of the functions. And then we will start to building histograms for each function. So we can see here, for example, the brown one, there is uh, activities for function A, activities for function B, and activities for function C. If you merge everything together, one above other, then obviously we can see that there is uh, something that recommend, recommend do a grouping about about the brown and, uh, and blue. And also, green is by himself, so make it a group by himself. But if it fits, of course, to the first ones, then we would like to merge them also. So following on what we saw earlier, this is like the initialization stage. And this is part of the steady state stage. So for deployment. So first of all, Comov is open source. It's already on the GitHub. We can access that. You can see it. It's there. It's designed to fit bare metal software and with Autos-based software. We are currently targeting free Autos to support that. So it will be threaded with free Autos. The first source draft of bare metal is already open source, as I said. And the support for free Autos is on the go. So it will be soon. And also on the GitHub, we can see a, a draft of the toolchain itself. It's already built for uh, Debian targets, uh, but, we all, but soon it's all going to be also open source. So pay attention. Uh, by mid-2020, we're going to have a full deployment of Core OV running on a real other platform with the OS. Currently, it's running on a few other platforms, and it runs on ISS, uh, which is cool. But because it doesn't depend on any hardware, Solutions, then it can run on any, uh, any hardware, but it has to be RISC-5. Uh, following next, small demos for usage of each Comor V API. The target is that we want like an SDK for developers to see uh, all the demos, all the APIs, and we can start design uh, is, uh, is code uh, based on Comor V. This is the GitHub that we are providing it. And soon it's going to move to Chip Alliance, but so far it's here. And also, we're going to provide the toolchain uh, branch to support it. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, questions? I have some time. So you would be typically loading your modules from um, NAND flash, and it's because you don't have NOR flash that you cannot directly run it? Or what is that, really that, driving that, it? That's correct. Uh, it, Yes, uh, the question was uh, where we are targeting to load in the storage itself. We are targeting for NAND or something like that, right? So the implementation itself, it doesn't care if it's a NAND flash. It can be even a network because we are providing a hook to users saying, load this function for us. We're going to provide him the address where the source destination and the, and the map for the, the function, and we'll decide how to load it. But yes, you're correct. Observation, it's, it's target for NAND when we are talking about uh, Western Digital. Yes? Does that mean it's a re-implementation of the Linux kernel module loader, basically? Uh, sorry, can you hear it? Is that basically the re-implementation of the Linux kernel module loader, this stuff? It's not, uh, it's more like, um, uh, the question that it was if it's uh, doing a change on the, uh, using a Whether it's a re-implementation re of the kernel module loader. Okay. If it's a re-implementation of the loader model, model in Linux, so the, the answer is no. It's uh, something that we are uh, working with many years. Uh, it's very bare metal, very embedded solution. I would not recommend using that on Linux, for example. There is a performance impact every time you go into the engine, right? But it's doing the same thing, right? 
it's doing yeah, it's doing almost the same thing uh, with variety of changes, yeah, and the toolchain support of course. Yes. Okay, so the question was if you are going to use this with uh, Zephyr. Uh, so the answer currently is no. Uh, there is a, it's all dependent on how much efforts we are going to do in free autos. Meaning if we're going to do this very model, very tiny changes in the kernel itself, then it will be very easy to move it to any other autos, right? So we can do it, for example, for Tredex. We can do it for Zephyr. We can do it for whatever. That's, it's time, time will tell. But currently, it's free autos. And the other question? Um, so the other question I had was, um, could you use this uh, more as a caching system where you could execute, say, from uh, nor flash, but say the performance hit, that any time something is used, if it's used frequently, you can look into um, the like high-speed memory that you have. Um, have you explored that? So that's, that's a long question. <laughs> I will not repeat that. But if I got it right, you're asking if uh, the cache concepts work uh, like, a, like a real cache, right? Like uh, using NLU, if functions are very hard, not to evict them. That's what you ask for? Uh, more keeping track of how frequently a page might be accessed and then only loading them if they're frequently because you can do yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. in other ways. Yeah, so yes, the answer is yes. We're investigating other options to, to, to monitor the cache itself, not uh, using just LRU. For example, we can use LFU, which is last, least frequently used. So yes, it's, it's, on the, it's on the plan. More questions? I have time, right, Palmer? Uh, just a minute still. A minute. Okay. Um, so you had to modify the toolchain, obviously, to uh, yes. do that. Uh, this, um, how does that interact with the link time optimization? <coughs> Okay, that's a good question. So it doesn't. <laughs> okay, so uh, for example, uh, not only link time optimization, also for uh, inlining, for example. Okay, so each function which is an overlay will not be inlined and in also will not participate in the LTO because it's very unique uh, f functions, very unique uh, so maybe flow. Maybe you could still do LTO within a group that you could define. That's maybe a good idea, right. Yeah, good. we can examine that. That's it. Thank you very much.